we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for coming. This is Intro to Linux, like it says on the screen. Hopefully, that's what you're all here for. Uh, I imagine there'll be a few more people wandering in because we're still short a handful. So, if there is any space, I know it's kind of cramped. We might need to relocate some of these chairs back behind the tables. Um, but we'll deal with that as it comes. My name is Andy Saylor. This is Matt Monaco. We're both in the computer science department. We're grad students here at CU. So hopefully we know what we're talking about. We're going to try to relate it all to you. Did you guys, I assume everyone got the email that I sent out yesterday. Uh, if you didn't, you should follow up with me after we get done tonight so I can make sure you're on the list for the future emails. And that's how we'll be getting information out to you, as well as the video after we're done with the session and various of the links that you will probably find helpful. So, what we're going to do to start out tonight is we're going to do a little bit of just a run through of some of the basic history of the background of Linux, and then we're going to get jump right into doing some stuff with Linux. While I'm doing the history section here, for people that don't have the VM set up or are having trouble getting the VM set up, Matt's going to be coming around. So. I guess just wave or signal him as he works his way around the room if your VM's not working, if you didn't have a chance to get it set up. Uh, if you don't have a laptop at all, there's not a lot you can do. But if you do have a laptop and the VM's just not set up, you're having some issue, grab him as he's coming around. He can help you out. We'll also be sticking around after we're done with the session tonight uh, for anyone else that's still having issues or has any extra questions so we can go over it. You are all going to want to have that virtual machine working sooner rather than later if it's not already. Uh, you're going to take a lot more from this class if you can actually try stuff out as you're going through it versus just having it thrown at you and expecting to remember it six months from now when you actually need to use it. So are there any kind of logistical questions before we get started? All right. We will get started then. So a brief history of Unix is really what we need to start by giving you guys some you know, historical background for those of you that may be interested in it. Uh, Linux follows in a long line of a whole bunch of operating systems that all kind of fall under this umbrella that we tend to call Star Nix or Wildcard Nix operating systems that end in the Nix sound essentially. So this is Linux, this is Unix, OS X, so anyone who's running a Mac is running a derivative of this. Um, there's a variety of other systems out there that do this. And the question is kind of, well, what, what is an operating system? What are we talking about when we say, well, what operating system are you running? And this all kind of concept dates back to about the late 1960s when we started doing computing for real. Uh, it's not nearly as this exciting anymore. But we used to have machine rooms, and what you would have to do is you would bring your program on a pile of cards to the machine room, and the operating system was the 10 guys are more often not in this picture, more often not women, sitting in the machine room whose job it was to run your 10 cards after the guy who came in before you used 10 cards were done running. And their job was essentially, these were big computers, they could only run one program at a time when the program was done, another program would be loaded manually, and they were at one per university, so you had hundreds of people that wanted jobs run, and it took a whole team of people to basically sit there and just keep the computer busy to make sure that when one program finished, another got loaded, so on and so forth. There was no software-based operating system. There was just a bunch of people plugging in one program at a time and letting it run to completion. And it sucked, because inevitably you had a bug, and you got your stack of 100 cards back with the one indicating where the bug was, and you had to go fix it. You could try again running it next week, and it was not at all productive. I don't think there's probably anyone here who's actually experienced this, but uh, there are still a few. Just they're getting fewer and far between. So after that, we decided that the idea started to come, why do we need this whole room full of people running this machine if we could write a computer to run the computer, if we could write a program to run the computer and have the computer essentially run itself. So that gave way to kind of the first range of operating systems and color photographs uh, that were available for computers. And these were single user, single program operating systems. So Unlike before, where you had to have a person there every time a program finished or loaded a new program, now you had a very simple operating system where you could give it 10 programs to run, and when each one finished, it would just automatically start the next one for you. Uh, these were called batch operating systems. This is the IBM System 360, which is, at the time, was like a big, famous, probably the first widely deployed IBM computer that people other than the government and a few elite universities actually had an opportunity to, uh, to work on. 
If anyone here is into project management, there's actually a famous book that was written about the development of this system because it was a project management disaster. Uh, and a lot of what we know about project management now kind of came out of some of these things. Um, so the book is, uh, blanking on it, it'll come to me. Anyway, classic software and project management story. Um, so after that, we, we have these big systems, the IBM 360, some very basic operating systems. And it was about this time that the first notions of Unix, or this kind of umbrella of operating systems that we use today, started to give rise. In particular, with this research system called Multix, which stands for Multiplex Information <coughs> Computing Service, where the goal basically was, well, we had these big computers that you could load in a long list of programs and would run each one, but what if we wanted a computer that could have two people working on it at once, so they could have two programs running at once, or that could somehow start sharing its resources between more than a single program at a time. So there was this big government research project done by MIT, GE, Bell Labs, which was also soon to become AT&T AT and, and Honeywell. Um, and two programmers working on the project, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, were kind of the, what we could consider the founding fathers of Unix. Um, so they're working on Multics. Multics was a big research operating system. It was never really deployed in the wild. Uh, it was mainly done for research purposes. It turned out to be very complex, big, over budget. Most of these companies pulled out before it was done. Um, but the, the, the basic ideas of a lot of things that we're going to start talking about tonight, namely hierarchical file systems, so the idea of having your files in a tree, folders nested within other folders, and your files down at the bottom. Uh, the idea of library configuration, so this concept you can plug something like, I mean, it wasn't mice because they hadn't been invented yet at the time, but the idea that you can plug something in your computer and it should just work right away uh, kind of first came along with this, uh, with this operating system. So soon after, like I said, this system pretty much fell apart and the companies that were all in it kind of pulled away from it. This is Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie here. Ken's the one standing, Dennis Ritchie's the one sitting. They both worked for Bell Labs. So Bell Labs left the Multics project because it got big and bloated and became a budget nightmare and kind of got scared of operating systems research. Their project managers were like, we're never going to do this again. Operating systems aren't going anywhere. It's a big nightmare, and we don't want to waste any money on it. But Ken Thomas and Dennis Ritchie, who were working for them, had actually started to use Multics. And when they pulled the plug, they're like, well, it was really handy for doing all of these things. So now it's a lot harder for us to get work done on these other projects that our project managers want us to be working on. So they went and basically rewrote more or less Multics on their own in their spare time without telling their supervisors because they'd been banned from working on any operating systems simply because they needed something that they could use for their work on other projects. And what they ended up coming up with was the original Unix operating system. Um, so Unix is a play of words on Multics. The idea was that they were going to make it simpler and out of all these big complicated features that Multics had. So they named it the cheekily the uniplexed information computing system versus the multiplexed one of Multics. Uh, and then there's also the Multics Unix, as in Unix uh, joke that goes along with that too. So the Unix name comes from a play off Multics originally. Uh, and it was Ken Thomas Dis Ritchie at Bell Labs. They basically invented this operating system so they could use it, but then they started giving it to their friends, and their friends thought it was really popular, and eventually their higher-ups at Bell Labs decided that, well, maybe this was something that could be useful. Um, so Bell Labs packaged it up and started releasing it to some early universities. Uh, and this was about the time where Bell Labs was turning into AT&T. So AT&T took this Unix operating system that these two guys had created, started kind of giving it out for free to various universities, using it for free inside their own house. Uh, and it started to catch on and become really popular because you had these big machine rooms on university campuses. They were still being staffed by a whole bunch of people, but now you could install Unix, you could have a whole bunch of people working at once, you could, didn't have to staff the computer, it was cheaper for the universities. So especially at the university and big research lab level, it really started to catch on. Um, and from there it started to, other people started to take it, make modifications to it, and you spun out this entire ecosystem essentially of Unix operating systems. Uh, AT&T eventually decided that it was actually worth money and they weren't going to give it away for free anymore and started spinning out System 3 and System 5, which became big commercial Unix systems that aren't really deployed at all anymore, but were very popular for 1980s and early 90s. Um, Sun OS, uh, Solaris, maybe some of you have been in big labs. A lot of big 
well, not a lot anymore, but there are still a handful of labs and like old computer labs that actually run these versions of Unix. Um, so when they started selling it though, the guys over at Berkeley, so the university uh, in California, said, well, we don't want to buy it. Let's just take the last version they gave us for free, rewrite that from scratch so we're not violating any copyright, and then start giving it away for free on our own. And they came up with what was called BSD, or the Berkeley Standard Distribution, which is still used today, and that kind of became the de facto free version of Unix after at and stopped giving it away. So th this rise of Unix in the machine room kind of was also right in lockstep. I mean, it was gratuitous timing to some extent right in lockstep with the rise of mini computers, uh, and which then gave way to personal computers. So this is the PDP-11. It was one of the first kind of computers that didn't take up an entire room. Um, it had no screen, it had no mouse. You programmed it with a series of switches and would load something in and then program the next line. Very slow, very tedious, but a total boon in terms of people, organizations smaller than 10 people actually being able to own a computer for the first time. Um, this quickly gave rise to the first PCs, or the, I mean, the hobbyist kits, people building their own. The rise of the Apple wasn't too long after this. I don't have a date on this. Uh, this would have been late 70s, uh, so the first Apple came out in the early 80s, um, in the original Macintosh in 1984. So we were quickly seeing a lot of people start to use computers, and there was this big freely available operating system. So they started to grab onto it too. So Unix was kind of in the right place at the right time for to be right there when computers really exploded and everyone started using them. So this is kind of the, uh, the family tree of Unix is. Uh, the running joke was, and still is, uh, I mean, you had a bunch of PhD students in computer science because computer science programs were just starting to come into existence at the time. And the best way to eat your thesis was to basically take Unix and write your own version of it. So everyone needed a PhD. You got a whole bunch of Unixes out of it. Um, and uh, you know, that's kind of the way things still work with programming languages and stuff. But uh, the ones of these that we'll kind of start to care about is, I mean, we would finally start to see Linux over here on the left. But uh, the ones we talked about before, BSD gets traced down. BSD actually eventually is what Mac OS X springs off of, which is still in use by many people today. Linux kind of came around on its own, uh, which I guess, well, that's the next slide, so I need to go into it now. And then there's all of the big commercial systems, which do still exist. Linux kind of destroyed the market for everything else uh, after it came out. So a lot of these, no one's really using AIX or Solaris or these big commercial Unix systems that were really popular at one time much anymore, because now you can have it for free and it's more supported because everyone's using it. So that brings up kind of the next phase in this development. So we're in the early 1980s, Unix is out there, BSD is out there, there's a bunch of different stuff out there. But we do kind of see this trend for companies wanting to charge for Unix and for people wanting to sell it. And this was also right in line. A lot of the people, most of the early computer scientists, I mean, this all came out of the counterculture movement of the 60s and 70s at the same time. So you had a lot of these people running around uh, still ready for the next great revolution. And they're like, well, this is stupid. We have all these computers. They're going to be a huge thing. Why should we have to pay money for them? And this notion of free software with capital F came out with the idea being that Maybe there's something fundamental about certain types of software that they should be freely available, not just in terms of cost, but in terms of you should have access to the source code, you should be able to modify it, you should be able to do whatever you want with it. There shouldn't be any restrictions on what you can use it for. So Richard Stallman, who was a prominent computer scientist at the time, started what was called the Free Software Foundation. I guess I should explain the last slide. Uh, this is the GNU, or it's the, uh, it's the mascot of the GNU project, which is this big software project spun off by the Free Software Foundation, whose goal was to take all of these programs and stuff that they were using, a lot of the basic programs you need on Unix, things like text editors, things like compilers, like the basic stuff you need that's not the operating system that you still needed to get anything done. And the GNU project took all of these and said, well, let's release a free version of them. Uh, and let's free with a capital F, or free as in freedom, not as in beer. Uh, and that way people can go about and use them for whatever they want to use them for. They can modify them, they can take them. And this is the mascot for that project. Richard Stallman was the guy that started that project, and then the Free Software Foundation, which is the one that organizes that project. And they were being pretty successful through the late 1980s, early 1990s, but while they developed this large free software ecosystem, they still didn't have a free with capital F operating system. 
BSD was out there, but there were some political reasons why they weren't interested in using it, and then there were a whole bunch, I mean, all of the mainstream Unixes were for sales. You couldn't, I mean, and they weren't open source. I'm willing to have to pay for them, but you couldn't take the source code, you couldn't modify them, you couldn't change them to run on your new experimental computer. Um, so Richard Stallman kind of started shopping around for a free operating system to go with all of this free software that he also had. And at about this same time, this is Tux, the Linux Penguin. Uh, so at about this same time, Linus Trevolds, also a grad student out in Helsinki actually, was working on his PhD in computer science and was writing on operating system. And what he had basically come up with is he had rewritten a Unix-like operating system from scratch, making some adoptions and changing some of the design principles. And when Richard Stallman came across this, they're like, okay, well, I'm okay releasing it for free, I don't care. And Richard Stallman's like, great, we'll call it Linux. So it's Linus Trivold's Unix, so that's where the Linux comes from. Um, we'll call it Linux, we'll release it as the free kernel for the rest of the GNU operating system, and that was basically the start of Linux. So they put it out there, they said, here you can have a free operating system, we have all of this great free software already developed that runs on it, and you can take it as a package, you can use it for whatever you want, you can make your own versions of it, you can run with it. And this combination of having both a free operating system and kind of the software environment that existed around it proved very successful. And so Linux came out in 19, yeah, so like 1991, 1992, um, was the first stable Linux release. So not that long ago in the grand scheme of things, but in the course of about 10 years, it exploded pretty readily and continues to do so. Uh, and really put most of those other Unixes that had been in use out of business. Everyone kind of switched to Linux because as soon as a few people switched, they started supporting it and it, it kind of gathered this critical mass following that made it make sense for everyone else to switch to because this is what everyone was writing software for and this is what everyone was working with and this is what everyone was trained in. Um, today it's used across the board. You see Linux in many of your phones. Android is all Linux based, so there's a Linux kernel running underneath your Android phone. You see it a lot in embedded devices. Uh, there's a good chance that your VCR, no one owns a VCR, so your DVD player, uh, or Blu-ray disc, your television, all of these things are likely running Linux inside. Um, it can be very tedious to write software directly on top of the microprocessor, so if you can put a lightweight Linux distribution in between, it doesn't cost you anything, you already know how to write software on it, it kind of makes a lot of sense from an embedded product development standpoint. Um, it is used on desktops. I'm running it here. You guys are all going to learn about running it tonight and over the next six slides, uh, over the next six sections. It's a little disconcerting. Um, and it's run a lot on servers. So it's actually one of the dominant operating systems on servers. When you go to a website, there's a very good chance that that website is being run off a of Linux server. Uh, Windows has been very successful in the desktop space, but they have lost a lot of ground to Linux in the server space. There's not just one Linux, there's a whole bunch of different flavors. They all run essentially the Linux kernel, but then they have their own set of packaging and their own set of programs that come with them. Because Linux free, you can do this. Anyone can take it and make their own flavor, essentially. Um, this is but a small subset of what's out there. We're actually gonna be working with Ubuntu Linux, which is probably the most popular from a desktop perspective today, uh, and is also fairly popular in the server and enterprise space. Uh, Red Hat's very popular in the enterprise space. If you work at a large company that deploys Linux, there's a good chance they're using Red Hat. Uh, Fedora is related to Red Hat. Fedora is basically the non-enterprise version of Red Hat. So there's a, there's probably five to ten that are in frequent use. There are hundreds to thousands out there total. Um, so when you see all of these things, they're all Linux, and what you'll be learning will really apply to all of them. Uh, but there are some kind of surface level differences between these various flavors. But the bulk of what we're doing, it doesn't matter as long as you're on a Linux system, or for that matter, as long as you're on really any Unix system, a lot of this stuff is cross compatible between them. So just kind of looking at how, how where, where Linux actually is deployed, like I said, in the desktop space, Microsoft still dominates, uh, with Apple has had their five to 6% for the last 20 years and continues to do so. Linux is growing there, but of desktop users, Linux is pretty insignificant still. Uh, server use, Linux is a lot more popular. I mean, OSX doesn't even have an offering for servers, really. So it's all Microsoft and Linux, and most of it's Linux. And then if you get into the supercomputer space, and you're looking at big supercomputers running big simulations, it's almost exclusively Linux. Uh, no one runs Windows on their supercomputer. Um, so, and 
This actually used to be the purview of Unix just in the last 10 years. This was all switched kind of to Linux uh, as it became more popular. But that is, so, so while you may not think Linux and a lot of you is just based on walking around and seeing if you're at your friend's house, when you actually get into kind of the professional space, Linux is very widely deployed uh, and is probably the most widely deployed operating system. So, are there any questions on, you know, this fun little history lesson that you can all promptly forget now because it doesn't actually have bearing on the programming parts? 